it will be uh, the question was uh, will it be a uh, free to play or a um, retail release and uh, it'll be free to play after you pay <laughs> <laughs> We're looking to target uh, Steam primarily. We have a lot of features in the game that will uh, capitalize on the Steam uh, features, and uh, but we will do physical retail as well in Europe. So. <laughs> Great. 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 Hold on to it. <laughs> it's probably a bit early, but did you guys think about mod supports or mod tools? Anything planned on that? <laughs> yeah, I like that too. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Um, we've loved working with the mod community, and excuse my voice, it's been going for five days now. Those of you who've met me before know that by Saturday night I'm talking like this, but. Uh, we love the modders, and it's incredible the work that modders have done on our projects in the past. And it, it always blows my mind, especially as, as a lead programmer, to see what the modders do when I'm like, there's no way you could have done that, and they do it. So, uh, Gregu is releasing with the uh, map editor, and uh, so people can start creating maps, trading them with friends, uh, trading them through Steam Workshop, so people can create their own custom maps, and then. Um, so we're, our, we've had some really great discussions with the mod community today, and so for modders out there, um, we're still using the same file formats, um, Alamo files, you guys know how our file formats work, you guys, everything's still in XML, um, and our, you know, our tools work, how our mega files work, so um, all the modders out there know how our stuff works, so they'll probably start modding the game when it's on, in beta, I bet. <laughs> so it is, yes, we're going to support mod, we love the mod community and what they do, and uh, yeah, we, we're, we really want to embrace it. Woo! Good question, good question. <laughs> what was the inspiration for using the, uh, the goo as a faction? Um, yeah. The name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Uh, yeah. uh, I think, uh, I mean, uh, actually, the, the, the Gregu Gregu name is um, is kind of a silly name, but we stuck with it because of the core the core idea I, the core idea of uh, creating a faction that uh, could truly be limitless. I mean, there's you know, real world limits, but this is a faction that ten years ago the technology wouldn't have allowed you to do. And it's singularity it, it, as well. Uh, well, we'll get into sci-fi next, but uh, just, from a, just from a gameplay point of view, it was really intriguing to think about the uh, the uh, the kind of game mechanics you could bring into a faction that could do the things that the goo does, and uh, it was both a technical challenge and a uh, game design challenge that uh, Petroglyph really uh, dug into deep, and uh, it was uh, uncharted territory. There's no book you can go to the store and you know figure out figure this stuff out. So um, we were very uh, intrigued by that, and then. Of course, we all love sci-fi, and uh, those of you who don't know who, what the Grey Goose scenario is, it's a, it's a hy hypothetical into the world scenario where uh, nanobots eat too much, and uh, that includes us, and uh, they take over the world and replicate out of control. Um, so there's a lot of uh, um, themes buried in why we fear that kind of thing, and so we try to explore those in the story as well. Awesome. So um, my question is, um, yes, um, I'm a little bit um, yes, excited about how did you get the idea to this? I mean, every idea starts maybe with inspiration or something else. I, I would like to know what made you think that this game would be good or how did you get the idea to that? Um. Uh, inspiration is a weird thing. I think, I think, uh, like we j just said, it kind of started with that core idea, and you kind of uh, then you go to the next step of like, well, what uh, what kind of world do you want uh, the goo to consume? Uh, and uh, so we started there, and then we started thinking about um, um, what uh, what a space opera is, and so we really uh, um, tried to make a, what I call a mundane space opera. Um, I don't know if this is translating, but. Uh, 
when I was a kid, uh, Star Wars and Star Trek uh, still existed in the realm of possibility. I, I laid in bed dreaming about flying the Millennium Falcon. And then, uh, I still you, do. Yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't? Uh, as you get older and learn more about science and, and, uh, and the, the reality of the world we live in, you start to, um, those, uh, those science fiction what ifs became uh, uh, fantasies. And uh, I want uh, us to kind of work together to give the new generation of uh, kids, you know, 13 year olds, uh, who have plenty of time to play games to kind of think, well, what if? And there's a lot of fantastic elements in this, in this concept, but uh, we also want to imbue it with uh, this, uh, this fuel for uh, imagination of young people to really like, hey, what if, uh, you know, so what if, if the, uh, the space, space is dark and dangerous? I still want to go there. So, um, so that's, that's more on, the, on the, the lore side. I think, I think from the game side as well, we really, uh, um, just we wanted to make an RTS, I and mean, it was not a matter really of uh, of um, thinking about options to uh, make it a whether it was going to be be a good market. We didn't look at it from the marketplace. We said, well, okay, it's 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 a dangerous thing to go to the moon. It's a dangerous thing to make an RTS. You know, they did it. They did the first one. Let's do the second one. So um, we just uh, Petroglyph was uh, the right partner for that. And so when we came with them, we're like, hey, let's make an RTS. Uh, they um, they stood up and put on their moon boots to join us. On <laughs> yeah, I'll back up on that a little bit too. Yeah, it was um, when these guys approached us. You know, they were so set about like number one. It's like we want to make awesome games, and it was like the first you know publisher that we had ever talked to. You know, that was like it was really, really about the games first. I mean. Everybody says it is, but you know, everybody's also looking at you know the bottom line and, and you know return on investment and all that stuff. And, and the the uh, gray box guys, you know, were um, just so passionate about let's just make something awesome. You know, let's just put our hearts and souls into this. And, and when they came to us with this concept, um, you know, our our imaginations went kind of wild because we're we're like, how are we going to make great goo as an RTS action, because we've always dealt with, you know, units and vehicles and infantry and aircraft and structure. And the great goo is the opposite, where it's, you know, it's liquid. It's, it's always moving, it's always consuming, it's growing, and it's like, we've never done anything like that in a real-time strategy game before. And so that was an incredible challenge from, like Josh was saying, technically, artistically, and, and with design, and even even with audio, you know, with what Frank's doing with the, the sound. Room. So we had so much fun because when you see the goo in its, it, in its liquid mode, it's that's not even pre-rendered or pre-made by an artist. Like our art team did not sit down and model and texture and animate the goo like we've always done. We would full procedural algorithm, uh, algorithm approach where it's completely programmatically designed through algorithms. We use a technology called metaballs, and we combine that with uh, flocking algorithms, and then add, add on, you know, and then um, you know, add on the texturing and everything. And that's that's what makes the goo so crazy, strange. Is it oozes around and it grows and eats and it crawls over all the terrain. So for us, it was just an incredibly cool challenge to try and really think outside of the gray box and come up with something. <laughs> it has really been the weirdest, coolest action we've ever done. And I gotta say, I have never been more proud of an RTS in our entire development history of my almost, well, I guess 30 years of making games all the way from Westwood all the way through Petroglyph. This is the one I'm, I'm by far the most proud of. What were you gonna do against toxic and negative players? Will you wait like Riot Games and what they're gonna do and destroy the game? Or what is your idea? I could talk a little bit to that. Yeah, go ahead. As far as everyone know, we removed in-game chat. And I don't think that is so As 
part of it because I had the right in-game chat and uh, and in-game voice, you know, in-game voice chat. I mean, I think we still have text. Yeah, chat. we have text chat inside we, the game. We still have text chat. I'm sorry, yeah, I didn't even. Really, but, but you can turn it off if you, you want. You can turn it off, and we 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 had I um I, I did the coding side on of the uh, the in-game voice chat, and that was one of our huge worries as well was the toxicity of of the internet and and you know. I just some of the experiences we've had have been unbelievable because you know so many gamers are, are great and people get chased away. Um, so our ideal thought was, well, if people really want to, you know, use it, you know, they can, you know, they can use Teamspeak or Ventrilo or, or whatever. So it, that was kind of and probably Josh. You could probably talk a little bit more to that, but that was that was our that was our fear, and um, we we want people to have a very positive experience. And we love to see. The, the advances that Riot is doing. Um, love to see how they're doing Hearthstone, you know, with the way that people interact through Hearthstone you know, from Blizzard. I'm just, that is just great, because nobody gets, you know, nobody gets slammed or, or hated on. And maybe Josh, you might want to add a little bit to that. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's, there's things you can do with technology, but the other thing is, is community. And I think we're, um, we're doing our best to really put a lot of emphasis on community. That, that's you guys. And uh, the, the culture and the, 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 the DNA of that community can really drive the habits of the game. Uh, the, the, you know, the great goo and the GG, um, we want that to kind of be a spirit <laughs> yeah. um, that kind of permeates uh, um, the game, because you know, we can only do so much. Uh, there's always going to be ways to convey uh, negativity and positivity, and, and whether it's on the forums or in the in-game in -game chat, I think as a publisher, more than anything, we want to make sure that uh, the community is healthy and uh, that we as a publisher set a good example and uh, and celebrate the individuals who kind of uh, uh, who raise up the, the quality of the community. Great. So this is sort of design question. From all the possible races of factions you could have created, um, how did you get the idea? Because you have human, half animal, and aliens, and robots, and humans. And at what point did you get the idea? Oh yeah, goo could be a good faction. I mean, if you would, if you would tell me we're gonna make a game and you play goo in an RTS, I would call you crazy. It's so crazy, it's genuine. But how did you get that idea? How did it actually make it into the game? Can I give it to Ted? Uh, I think this is a good question. question. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's a story. But, uh, <laughs> um, well, it's a story. Thing. I think I think the main thing was we started with the, with the goo first. Yeah. Um, we uh, we said, well, let's figure out uh, the let's figure out an RTS that where the goo is the centerpiece, and then we built the other factions around that. Um, at Amora, and actually, I'll speak to kind of more design here, and this is probably. Uh, more Petroclus realm is we've looked at strategy games as a whole, and in the past uh, probably decade or so, um, the the genre as a whole kind of splintered, and a lot of different RTSs were innovating on different things, and there's a lot of great um, great choices being made in innovation, but on the whole, um, the genre um, kind of uh, became um, um, dispersed. Uh, Starcraft became the RTS, and there was a lot of young kids that came in today that were like, is this like StarCraft? Um, and that's all they know. Um, or like, is this a MOBA? <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, and then with that, we went to, you know, in Petroglyph, we had a great, great pedigree with RTS, and uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of command and conquer DNA, and in Grey Goo, we kind of looked at that as the center line, um, and that's probably most represented in the beta, uh, I would say. Um, but from the, the humans, uh, it draws from a lot of uh, a lot of the innovations done in uh, in some of the macro strategic games like Supreme Commander, Total Annihilation. There's there's a, there's a little bit of dash of that, and the goo. It, it's really its own thing. Uh, I think when we take a lot of pride in it being something new to RTS, but at the same time, it, it offers the, the aesthetic of of uh, being agile and nimble, something that's a little bit more tactical, like your Dawn of Wars and your, uh, and your uh, Company of Heroes and games like that. So I think our hope is that. It's it's not so much that uh, I think a lot of people say we're competing with StarCraft. So no, no, we want we want we want to stand with StarCraft. The RTS is a genre and that it's still alive. Um, I think uh, my hope is that um, people who have StarCraft will buy Grey Goo, and that I always the people who play Grey Goo say, oh, you know what, I can take StarCraft. There's people who are too afraid of StarCraft, and I hope that we can make an RTS that gives them a love for the genre, so they can have the, the courage to kind of uh, um, demand more of the industry to have more games like that. Um, 
at Greybox, we really we really value games that have depth of play. Uh, we say that you know remind our guys that hey, we're, we're not curing cancer here; we're making games. But the person who, who cures cancer, they might be playing one of our games now. And so, <laughs> so you know, we take a lot of pride and we you know, put a lot of purpose behind that. Uh, but um, we want to ultimately want the industry to be healthy and vibrant. Uh, my my son is playing games right now, and I want him to have good games to play. And great movie he plays every day, literally. Yeah, and to add on to that a little bit, like you were kind of talking about the three factions, um, there were a lot of incredible minds that, that went into this because you know we had people on the gray box side working on this, and then a lot of people don't realize that Weta Workshop out of New Zealand is also involved Woo, in the project. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah, so they're, I mean, they're amazing. You know, so we've got these, you know, these, these guys, uh, these 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 wild guys in Houston. You know, they're from Texas. It's like, who, who, who are these guys? And, like, and they, they've got all these crazy cool ideas. And then we, you know, we, we throw us into the mix. You know, we're like, okay, how can we make a game out of this? And then we've got Weta, you know, has worked on, you know, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, and District 9. Um, and they really had a lot of really cool collaboration to throw into it. And for us, I think it was, the cool thing was the three unique, cool, different factions that all yeah. play differently. They're not reskins, you know, of, of the same faction. You know, they each one of them has a very unique, cool play style um, that is constantly, you know, really, really making your your um, your experience, especially through the uh, the tech upgrades. You know, you can even pick a faction and you have 15 choices of different ways to, to upgrade your technology. So for us, it, it was like it was about that fun play of having three amazing factions, you know, with a lot of balance work behind it to make them awesome and play together and, and uh, just make that game so replayable with the AI and, and playing with your, you know, friends on multiplay. So we're gonna take uh, three more questions. We have one right here. Oh, one right there. There's four I do want five. to take some over here. We'll be, we'll be brief. Okay, okay. <laughs> we'll do more than three. But, okay. Yeah. We'll do ten minutes of question. Sure. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, since you said you're very proud of the uh, real project due to its unique race, uh, will each faction feature its own music? Oh, oh there you go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, um, yeah, definitely the uh, the soundtrack for this game was a lot of fun to work on because, first of all, I uh, you know for as long as I've been doing this, I mean I I was with you know Westwood when we did the first real time strategy game Dune Two, and everything that we've done since all the Command and Conquers and then Petroglyphs history of course doing Star Wars Empire at War Universal War, Universe at War with Sega and and um, so and now now that we're having the chance to do this project, it's probably the most creative in terms of the, the vast uh, you know, differences of these factions, the world, the whole science fiction and the story behind it. And that really energizes me and, as an individual and as somebody that gets to sink their teeth into you know, how this audio is going to translate and how the soundtrack is going to translate. So when you have three unique factions, what made sense to me? Three unique soundtracks. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so for everyone who, I mean, I, I spoke to a good number of you throughout the show, but for people who are here that haven't gotten the, uh, the spiel of this yet, the, um, just to give you what, what's in store, the, the beta faction, um, aesthetically, of course, has got, you know, heavily armored vehicles, you know, very smoky, fire-based, you know, industrial. real gritty, gritty looking uh, and, and feeling uh, play style. So I went with an industrial soundtrack which has like metallic percussion and distorted synthesizers and heavy brass to kind of emulate yeah. that grit. So gives them, gives it, it gives it a, a good personality and I, I really wanted to separate that for each faction. So the humans, which is very clean and crisp looking and futuristic and high tech and hovering vehicles, I gave them a modern electronica soundtrack um, combined with a little bit of orchestral elements throughout to kind of identify some organicness mixed with the machine and um, and then of course the goo, which was the most fun to come up with something for, um, because it's so new and so different, and it to me it seemed very eerie and mysterious, and I wanted to do something that conveyed that. So 
What I came up with after some experimentation was really dark orchestral music and choir music mixed with dubstep. <laughs> So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a really fun mix of music. And final thing I want to say about it is, for anyone who was Command & Conquer fans, you might remember a little something called the jukebox mode in for music. We're bringing that back. Thank you very much. Enough. I guess that's good enough. I was going to say, somebody embellish. <laughs> Maybe so. Good Maybe so. Good question. Somebody buy him a drink. Yeah. <laughs> <They're> free. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I know. I know you guys like your game, how it is, and we all know it's fantastic, and it looks fantastic, and it plays fantastic. But um, since you are distributing it on Steam, will there be any possibility for the community to develop any mods for it over the Steam Workshop? So they can enhance other players and their own experience for the game by adding new factions or any new graphics, textures, whatever. So uh, we, we really like the Steam uh, platform. Uh, you know, we, we've become very big Steam fans after uh, developing on it for the last several years, not just this project, but several others. And uh, I can say that we will have a really robust, a very robust uh, train editor for people to create their own maps with. It's probably a little too powerful, but given the fact that the things that we've seen uh, you guys create, um, I know that if we give you more than enough, you'll be able to create just amazing things with it. So, uh, yes. Uh, We'll, we'll be giving out a map editor with the release of the, the product, and uh, it's very full feature. It's going to allow you to do a lot of things. And then we're going to be listening to you guys to hear what else you want us to put into it. So, you know, if you respond back to us and you say, hey, can, can we get this kind of support? Can we, get, can we get the support for creating our own textures, adding our, our uh, own props to the map, maybe uh, scripting your own missions or something? Let us know, and we can start working on that stuff. So. And also... Just, just to follow people back to our heads up, kind of, kind of repeat it. As, you know, we're always blown away by what the modders do. And like I said, you know, I was the lead programmer in Star Wars Empire and War. Mm -hmm. And, you know, designers would ask me, like, oh, can we do this? And, you know, like, well, it's just not in, the, in, the, in that scope. And then suddenly the mod community does it without <laughs> source code. And it, kind of blew, it, it would blow my mind. I'm like, how in the heck can I email the guy and be like, how did you do that? <laughs> and the mod community is so clever. And like I kind of reviewed, or to review what I said earlier, we've already had some modders come by visit today, and they know our file formats, and they know our texture formats, they know how our Alamo engine works, and they know our mega files. And so I think we're going to see awesome stuff from the mod community. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, two more. Um, I'm one of the more um, single player focusing guys before I hit the multiplayer. And I want to know how long can I play single player in the three factions before I have to hit the multiplayer for more content. Good question. <coughs> so I, I, we've, uh, we've been kind of estimating it at around 15 to 20 hours, depending on your skill level. Um, and there are three modes, uh, or three levels of difficulty that you can play those missions on. And you'll get different achievements and bonuses based on uh, the difficulty levels that you, you play through the campaign. So there's, there's some replayability there as well. Um, the nice thing that I think uh, we did with the uh, single player campaign though, which is you know 15 missions, is that uh, uh, it is the exact same gameplay that you get in multiplayer. So you're not playing one game in single player and then playing a different game with different units and different balance in multiplayer. 
So by the time you're finished playing the single player campaign, we want you to feel really trained up, really able to play on the multiplayer level without you know, being crushed, you know, <laughs> because you're coming into it and it's like, wait, I, I didn't play this before. What, what is all this new stuff? Or why is this stuff all different? Um, we thought that was really important. And because we really want to grow the online community for this game, this is what, this is what makes games truly, truly spectacular and, uh, and uh, you know, valued, is, is to make it uh, popular with the online community. Because you guys, uh, you know, we, we've really migrated away from, from single-player games recently, right? With, you know, with, the, MMOs. with the MMOs and things like that. And uh, because we're getting back to the core, because we have a really exciting and uh, engaging story to tell, you know, we, we think that uh, this game is going to bring us back to that, that core that core that made RTS games so valuable and so so fun to play. So, you know, you're, you're, you're completely set up to play multiplayer after you finish the campaign. But, but to, to uh, piggyback on that, like I do everything. <laughs> My friends call me a conversational terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> because I blow up every conversation and take over. No, um, but <clears throat> I got to say, I suck at multiplayer. I get my ass kicked by other players all the time. I remember doing years of war and I got in the beta and I'm like, man, I'm gonna rock. And I got my butt kicked so fast and I was a lead programmer and I'm like, what? So to your point, I love, so our game, something that is really, we've really evolved is this game, we've done an all new AI system that we've never done before. And our past games and a lot of RTS games do a scripted system where the AIs run through pre-built stories or pre-built scripts on what they're going to build, how they're going to attack, waves of attack, timing, and they kind of just run these scripts and they try and survive and they, they look into the fog of war and they kind of cheat and they'll sometimes give themselves extra credits and you know and it's and the idea is to make the game as fun as you can you know even if you know even if the AI is kind of tweak it or you know adjust it in the background we want to make a good game but the this AI is making single player and playing against skirmish, you know, skirmishing against the AIs, and skirmishing, you know, like co-oping up with your friends and playing AIs, insanely fun, and that is something I love about this thing so much, because we're using a reactive AI system now. For the first time, we've never done this kind of system before, where that AI will, it won't, it won't go and look through the fog of war and see what you're doing. It sends scouts in. I mean, if you guys are playing in the booth, you'll see scouts come in and look at your booth or your base and run off. That information is being used as it sees what you're building. If it sees you building aircraft, it's like, man, I'm going to go start building anti-aircraft. So it and it it will react. If you change your play style, it'll change its play style. And so even when you're playing through the campaign, you know the story campaign, if you if you change your strategies or try and win that campaign mission differently, the AI is going to change it up, and it's not going to do the same thing that it did every time. And you're not. You're gonna have a very hard time kind of finding those exploits of the, you know how how to like beat the AI and trick the AI. So, um, so just in terms of that, I think the single player is, is going to be very replayable as well as you know we don't have to go online and play multiplayer with strangers. You know we can group up and, and just try to take on the AI and just set that AI on hard and try to beat it. So I just want to say that for me, just like you, it's like I, you know I love the single player and. and uh, it's, I think we're going to have a lot of fun with that. Okay, here we go. <laughs> right, we are going to squeeze in two more questions. Guys, you can We'll be short. Short, sweet. That's not possible. Always. <laughs> no piggybacking. All right, here we go. <laughs> no conversation. Thanks, uh, first off, thanks for the big event. Thanks for the... Thank really you, guys. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. And my question would be something that I bugged one of you about even before: is esports and competitive, the competitive part. Um, Very good. I was wondering that um, uh, do you see your game as a potential esport? And if so, how do you plan on supporting it? So we have definitely been looking at esports, and we've been looking at what makes those games so popular and what those players are looking for in a game. And uh, I have to say that our core focus up until now 
and continuing <laughs> forward has been to just first and foremost make a really great game. You know, make a very well balanced, well polished game. Uh, because if the game isn't good in the first place, you're not going to bring people in to play the game as a sport. Um, but we have been looking at some of those features, and uh, we were discussing them internally. So, um, you know, the, some of those things are definitely being talked about. Uh, we are planning around them, uh, but uh, but we are we are, um, and, and we will have some of those things in the game when it when it launches. Yeah, absolutely. So. I'm not sure if you want to add anything to that. Uh, yeah, I, th I mean, I'm just going to repeat what Ted said, but uh, just so you know that the, the design, from a design point of view, a lot of considerations were made to make this game viable and competitive, and there's, so there's not going to be a lot of goofiness. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, we really took it first and foremost. Let's make a really fun we call it beer and pretzels game. This is a game that you can bring your friends over on a Friday night, set up a land, have a really good solid time, it's a land mode, yeah. and uh, and feel like it's, it's it's truly competitive. You're playing in chess. You know? um, but, um, yeah. 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 No way. You know, we actually have an hour. If everyone is willing to stay for a little bit longer, we can do more questions. Um, it's Just a, it, one. It's really, it's really short. Okay, I'm going to give it to him, but then I'll give it to you, and then everyone else's uh, questions will continue. Oh, so we can't keep going? Um, we can. Hi. Uh, we've been developed a corporate way to um, sing the uh, like corporate way to campaign. We uh, that was uh, that was not part of the original design. Um, uh, we have talked about it internally a little bit, but uh, but no, the the game doesn't currently support that. Uh, but we are we are always considering things like that for any future work that we do on the on the product line. Uh, you can. Uh, Josh just reminded me that you can play skirmish mode against the AI. So you can set up various scenarios, you know, on on any of our uh, multiplayer maps. So you know, you can team up with a friend and, and play against the AI. And as Mike mentioned too, you know, the AI is going to adapt. So depending on which friend you bring and and how you play the game, the game's going to feel different each time that you play. And uh, Ted and Ted Blaska said too, that was kind of the question by. The game, you do not have to have an internet connection to play, which we thought was a really important thing. So if you're on a laptop or, you know, traveling or, or you know, going away to a, you know, a cabin for the weekend, you don't have to have the internet connection to make sure that you have to play. And then on top of that, yeah, the game has full support for land mode because we want to start thinking back about all those great land parties and stuff like that. So we, we have uh, full land support as well. <laughs> Any others? Are we all good? Okay, we're good? Right, all right, keep them coming. Oh, we got one more. Yeah, um, I would like to ask something about the story. Um, do you plan on expanding your um, fictional universe in other ways than um, the game itself or add-ons like books or CDs or anything? Hand that one to Chuck. It <laughs> <laughs> depends who you ask. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> uh, I think when we set out, I mean, I think we really wanted to. Uh, for the good to be compelling, we wanted to create a world that felt authentic and, and lived in, and so we. we we built more depth into the world than probably needed for an RTS. Uh, I think uh, there's uh, some uh, good framework there to really extend it, uh, both in, in, in a lineage of RTS. Uh, someone mentioned the silent ones. Uh, that's something that uh, is um, is planned for for you know um, extensions um, and to be able to go cross genre um, or cross media. Those are things that uh, we're looking at as well. And you know, we want to again, kind of like the uh, the game. You want to see uh, what people respond to and kind of know know where you want to go. Uh, and uh, I think from a from a narrative point of view, we have a destination where we want to be, and we're looking at the fans to tell us how to get there. Good question. Um, I really like the game. And I just wanted to know if you are currently working on any other projects or are planning to work on any other, pro other projects. 
Uh, yes. Uh, um, yeah, I think part of the reason we all look so tired is because we are starting that up as well. Uh, so yeah, we, uh, we're, we're committed to this, pro this product. We, uh, we have a lot of pride in it, and, uh, and we, uh, we uh, love it, and so we, we want to keep going with it. So, uh, you know, answer yes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. What? I missed it. Oh, are, they, are we done? Yeah. Okay. Any, other, set, any other questions? Okay, this one. One, two. Okay, come on. Keep them coming. <laughs> no, I think it just. If it's lit up, yeah. When we take the he says, I will edit it and he says in this game. If not, we will film later. <laughs> you guys are going to have to talk to me about this outside. <laughs> the first rule of Easter eggs is there are no Easter eggs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am notorious for putting Easter eggs into games, and uh, I love them, and you know, thanks for the reminder, because <laughs> we have been so busy working on this thing, and, we, and it just didn't even cross my mind. Now, when we do Easter eggs, we actually always let, you know, our, our publishers know what, you know, what it is, and should we take it out, and you know, this is kind of a funny thing, so we never go secretly put something in and then let it go off to market, except for the Ocean I'm Burning incident with Kyrandia, <laughs> um, which is a great story. Maybe you should tell them about that. Yeah, a great story on its own. Um, but, uh, no, but um, yeah, so I just want to say, thanks for the reminder on that. No, we will not go, and we will make sure that our partners here are aware if there is a little something that, you know, let them know and be aware of it. But, you know, yeah, that's, that's I love doing those things, so we'll see, we'll see what we can come up with. <laughs> and then bring it up in the forums. <laughs> yeah. Actually, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the piggyback on that for a minute. Uh, there was a, a little audio-related uh, Easter egg, if I recall, that was requested via the, the publisher. So uh, we'll see if somebody can figure it out. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> How do I not know about this? It has to do with the goo epic. That's the only thing I'll say. Oh. And there's all oh, one other thing. <laughs> Almost every one of our games always gets what we call a Ted head hidden Ted head. In, into the game somewhere. And he hates it because he hates <laughs> the shit. And so I think first and foremost we gotta figure out where to put the Ted head because yeah. it is a tradition and Ted loves having his head. Oh yeah, in the I game. love it. <laughs> This is my last question. Are we able to come up the galaxy like in the game uh, Star Wars uh, Forces of Corruption? What was the question? Uh, are you able to conquer the galaxy? Yeah, are you able to conquer the galaxy? Is like more than one planet. Yeah, more than one planet, like uh, one of our previous Star Wars titles. Uh, and the answer is... Good question. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully that will happen. Because you know, we don't expect this to be the very first game and the only game in the uh, Grey Goo uh, universe. Um, you know, we want more games to come down the line, and we already are thinking about that right now. Yeah, great question. Yeah. So, there's two different stories now. Which came first, Grey Box or Grey Goo? Um, yes. Grey, Grey Goo came first, uh, and then there's, it's odd, we have, Grey keeps coming up in our, in our, in our culture, but uh, Grey Box actually came from uh, our experience with Petroglyph, they, we had a great box a version of the game, and I don't know if you're familiar with great box, but in software development, there's a period of development called great box testing. It's where you, you test the functionality, and uh, in games, the games industry, you test the fun before you really commit all the work to art. We had a really, really fun great box. We literally had hoot and holler and laughing playing the great box version of this game, and uh, that's something that as a publisher, you know, we're a new publisher, so we write our own rules. Uh, we thought, well. That's where the fun is born. That's where the embryo is is, is inseminated. <laughs> uh, and so we, we took that as our name. Um, and uh, it was just coincidence that it was Grey Goo. We had all kinds of naysayers throwing flags in the field. And and uh, even with the name Grey Goo, we had lots of naysayers throwing flags in the field. But uh, um, we just kind of went with it. Talk to the paper game. 
the, the, the paper version. Oh, yeah, I can talk about that. Uh, yeah, just to add a little bit to what uh, Josh was saying, too. Um, uh, you know, in our, uh, in our concepting phase, it starts even before we get to a gray box uh, gameplay state. Uh, and what Josh is uh, referring to is, uh, you know, the, the, the map is just gray grid, and the units are boxes and squares and, uh, and really ugly shapes to differentiate them uh, from one another. Um, but before we even did that, uh, we started on, uh, on uh, paper. Uh, with uh, pieces of paper on a large board with two tables pushed together, and it was uh, a paper game. Uh, so, you know, a board game, if you will. And uh, so we, we played multiple, multiple games on this piece of paper to validate the, uh, the theories, the game theories that we had before the three factions and how the bases would build together, how everything, all the pieces would fit. So, um, you know, uh, the process started very early, and uh, uh, what Josh is mentioning when they came down and they played that first game that, that was in a completely gray environment. Um, yeah, he's right. There was a lot of, uh, you know, excitement over it because um, it was a great moment for us as Petroglyph because we were able to create a, a version of the game that was very playable, very testable, and uh, we could prove out the fun very early on. And that is what uh, has allowed us to spend the last 16 months balancing this game iterating on it, making it as good as it is. Uh, so we've really focused on quality, and we've had the time to do that, which is not usually always the case. Um, we've all worked on, well, you know, the, the people up here have worked on projects before where you're working till the very last minute to get a game out the door, and you're all crossing your fingers going, well, I hope it's a fun game, too, because we haven't had time to play it. We just finished it. Uh, but we actually finished the core gameplay 16 months ago, and we've been making it better ever since. So, you know, we think that that is, you know, definitely the right way to go in developing a game, and we're really thankful to be working with a, a publisher like Graybox that's given us the time to make that game as good as it is. All right, guys, well, we are going to conclude the Q&A session. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Um, if, you, if you have any other questions that you weren't able to ask, you can. Or around. Yeah, you, they're around. They're also going to be at Gamescom tomorrow. You can ask them there as well. Um, so I guess now we'll just go ahead and jump right into the raffle or giveaway. Woo! And here That's good. Woo! Yeah. Please give it up for Mike. Thank you, guys. Thank you.